and there we go off into the blue actually considering the clouds dark blue uh, really but the important bit we are on the road again going to the east unfortunately i lost my cool map so i'm gonna have to use this kind of shitty road map anyway first of all nitra and then we're gonna go to the banska cities but uh, also a couple of things around so let's start with a very tiny place but with a bit of interesting history to it one of our little weird ideas when traveling central eastern europe is looking for ideal socialist towns we have one in Kraków, a place called nova huta the most spectacular of them all but here in slovakia turns out they have a, a tiny little bit uh, of their own welcome officially to dedina mladeže the land of youth so uh, what you have around you basically that's it a main square and then the streets leave in straight lines and uh, it's pretty much it 420 people live here so when i say it's an ideal socialist town exaggeration it actually was never meant to be one it's an experimental farm um, and uh, around people should live but they did lay the place out according to the um, socialist town rules so we have a main square and then all the uh, streets live in straight lines but doesn't it sound like half of uh, new cities in the world anyway what's the important bit here yeah, they started actually planting rice and it supposedly looked in the 50s a bit like a little version of Southeast Asia or something now uh, think of a idea that ma many people know as a kibbutz did did it actually work out well depending on a point of view I guess there are people who would say yes definitely people who live here today they um, um, I asked around a bit and they are pretty happy at least officially when it comes to the general picture well one thing for sure they don't grow rice anymore but they do make homemade palinka now that palinka was mentioned look at the languages it's not only slovak anymore you will see plenty of hungarian here southern slovakia is bilingual and sometimes mono you will see more hungarian and slovak actually this is something i would love to talk about more during the great hungarian adventure in the future but in the meantime the dina mladeže says goodbye and we are continuing on to nitra and the approach already is really awesome because you can see in the background a hill and the tower of the cathedral on top of it and uh, mind you you have a hill next to a river so i think no surprise for hundreds and thousands of years people were living on top of the hill and this is one of the reasons why nitra for us today is very important as it used to be one of the capitals of an empire but first of course what else a synagogue so we're just gonna jump in for a second or two now first of all you can compare here how it looks like and how it used to look like back in the day but inside you're gonna see a very interesting thing again plenty of hungarian but if i tell you this is a late 19th century synagogue after the last episode hungarian language shouldn't be um, a surprise and today as per usual it is a cultural center so we had a look great but let's continue towards the castle hill and i'm sorry to say nitra is not the prettiest slovak town not their fault they were bombed during the second world war and rebuilt during communism which unfortunately is very much visible still and the castle hill itself there's actually hardly any castle there are some walls and that's it there's the cathedral of course but it's all in the end not important what is important more than a thousand years ago nitra was one of the capitals of the great moravia now first things first they were the celts of course here there were germanic tribes but then you have the avar kaganat so the avars officially came from around mongolia but very often those were actually big groups of all the different ethnicities slavs were in it as well when the avar kaganat fell slavs started creating their own little countries so in today's moravia beginning of the 9th century you have a prince called moimir and in nitra you have pribina actually moimir conquered pribina and threw him out and then he created the nucleus of a country we call today the great moravia but actually the person who made it great is 
Svetopluk, who lived in the second part of the 9th century, and he was actually a local boy from Nitra, gained power in the Great Moravia, and he made it great and an empire. For a time it was today's Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, a good piece of Austria and southern Poland, including what is today my lovely city of Kraków. But more important still, they understood that they have a very important and powerful neighbor, the Frankish Empire to the west. So you gotta be friends. For example, the first missionaries came from the west, but also you need options. And one of the rulers of the Great Moravia sent an envoy to the Byzantine Empire, asking the Emperor Michael to send some missionaries as well. And he did. From today's Greece, from Thessaloniki, Constantine and Methodius came, but they came with something extraordinary. They came with an alphabet created for Slavic languages, and they started something even more extraordinary, translating the Word of God into Slavic language. What's so special about it? For a long time only three languages were considered worthy of the word of God, Hebrew, Greek and Latin. And now you've got a Slavic language? To give you a perspective, Luther translated the word of God into German 700 years later. So what you're seeing right now is Proglas, the prologue to the translation of the Bible. And mind you, they were also great organizers. So for example, there was a theological school teaching uh, the word of God in a Slavic language, plus, of course, many churches and so on, plus two archbishoprics in today's Serbia and Moravia. And in Nitra, they founded a bishopric. So it's all very important things still today. Of course, it wasn't that easy. For example, they had to go to Rome several times to defend the idea of teaching in a Slavic language, but Constantine, known actually as the philosopher, was also great in rhetorics, so always defended himself so well, popes actually always stood by their side. Now, if you've been scratching your head thinking, but wait a second, Cyril and Methodius? Constantine, in one of those moments in Rome, entered the monastery, changed his name into Cyril, several months later he died and was actually buried there. So Methodius came back, he became Archbishop in Moravia, he was of course very much in Nitra as well. After his death, one of his pupils, Gorast, took over. But um, bad times, in the end, Gorast very soon was thrown out of Great Moravia and it was, in the end, the Latin Church that won, so to speak. And then, several decades later, Hungarians came Great Moravia fell and the idea of um, Slavic language for liturgy and the word of God, Slavic alphabet, were pretty much forgotten for a thousand years. But then, then comes the 19th century. I mentioned several times that the Slovak national movement had a problem. There was no Slovakia back in the day to look upon. Well, actually, there was. It was simply named Great Moravia. Mind you, Nitra was one of the capitals, one of the centers of that state. And the two Slavic apostles, Constantine Methodius, were here for many decades preaching the word of God in Slavic language with Slavic alphabet. And that's decades before Hungarians even arrived, not even talking about uh, Christianity and accepting it. So automatically, Constantine Methodius become Slovak national heroes. Best example, according to tradition, they brought to Slovakia the Patriarchal Cross. So it's today on the coat of arms of the country and of course on the coat of arms of the Nitra bishopric, plus letters from the Glagolithic alphabet. Mind you, Glagolithic is the father of the Cyrillic alphabet and the language is known today as Old Church Slavonic, kept alive by many uh, Orthodox Christian churches. Now when it comes to all the documents, here you've got the oldest document from the territory of Slovakia from the 12th century with names of 30 people living in Nitra at the time and they're all Slavic names. So this is not simply pieces of paper what you see. Those documents are very important in today's arguments and debates about national identity and who was here first and so on and so forth. All those pieces of paper are extremely important. Now Svetopluk himself became pretty much the first Slovak king. Now mind you, he was called king by one of the popes in the document, plus even more, the only son by another pope, and that was only referring to people like emperors. And actually there was a time when Great Moravia was on par with the Frankish Empire. So today you will find the monument of Svetopluk in front of the castle in Bratislava. With all that said, a little ironical twist, 
Svetopluk actually was a big enemy of Methodius. He was in favor of the Latin Church, so he was the one who, after Methodius' death, threw out his pupil Gorast from the Great Moravia. But this is something the national myth doesn't really mention. And I call it national myth, because I believe that's pretty much a 19th century invention based on the good old Middle Ages. But if you create a national myth, do it properly. And I have to say, the Great Moravian national myth in Slovakia somehow speaks to my mind and heart. So another interesting story, another important piece of Slovak identity we have covered. And mind you, I would love to show you more of the beautiful views from the castle hill, more of the walls that are left from the castle and the cathedral. But unfortunately, as those are indeed my first steps in the virtual world and so on and so forth, I have no idea how to get rid of this sun ray and the sun generally speaking. So actually the whole story I wanted to tell you live, but most of my footage is like that, completely ruined and I cannot use it. So that you're aware it's not all roses, unfortunately. But I can show you the cathedral because there was no sun inside and the cathedral actually has nothing to do with Great Moravia anymore. It's a proper Baroque cathedral, as you can see. But here's an interesting detail. Hungarians didn't simply conquer or destroy the Great Moravia when they came. Partly, Great Moravia joined the new Hungarian kingdom. An example is the fact that Nitra for several hundred years was autonomous within the Hungarian kingdom. How does it translate into the virtual world? Several times I mentioned that you can that you have Slovak national ideas in Europa Universalis. You can actually play as Slovakia or to be specific as Nitra. So you have to start as Hungary, release Nitra as a vassal, which is possible, and switch to Nitra. And then then you have to get out of the vassalage, ask the Ottomans for help, and they will. And then when you're independent, well, then you start eating the neighbors. So um, let's start by eating up Moravia and bits of Bohemia. Then let's grab pieces of southern Poland and all of Hungary, nibbling on Bohemia still. Then it's a good idea eventually to grab Vienna and a piece of Austria. And when you have it all, the last remaining thing is to eat up whatever is left of Bohemia and Silesia. And eventually, when you do all of that, well, why shall we do it in the first place? To change history. Let us recreate the great Moravia. And you gain a cool achievement, which is not very popular, as you can see. Yes, I know, I am 40 and this is how I spend my free time. So don't judge me, or actually do, but before you do, let's jump east of Nitra for a moment to a little village. Here you've got um, the officially the oldest Slovak church. What you're looking at right now, this is young, this is only 900 years old. The old bit is the presbyterium, more than a thousand years, and this piece does remember the great Moravian times. So um, let's call it a tick on the list. But let's leave Great Moravia aside, because Nitra is not only about that, it's also a university town. And there's one way to see it. When you find a place where the old walls of the city used to be, very often today you're going to have some kind of park. And when you have a park in place of old walls, you're going to find students having a beer or two. So that's first proof of the place being university town, but let's go into university quarter. I promised you in Bratislava we are going to find more UFOs. Here it is, part of university called, surprise surprise, after Constantine the philosopher. Now actually, when it comes to the UFOs, not a big deal really. In the 70s, in the communist states, it was actually a very popular piece of architecture, but it still looks kind of cool. What I found more cool though, is what you're gonna see on the pavement. Turns out, kind of a local tradition, I guess, when you graduate, you will um, write your name, surname, whatever it would be, with your new um, position and it's kind of a little cute detail that we saw in actually many a place. Now before we leave Nitra, an obligatory Polish gentleman and an obligatory uh, view from the hill but in a bit of a different uh, way, different point of view so to speak. So with this nice little view let us leave and go towards the east. 
we are going towards the Banska cities, but on the way we're also going to have a quick look at a little village which has something um, very interesting in it. Have I already mentioned the Ottoman Turks? Now many of the fortresses that we see on the way were built and fortified against the Ottoman incursions. But what about the actual people? How do they prepare in case of a Turkish Ottoman invasion? Well, in a little village called Brcholovce, they supposedly started building their houses into caves, uh, into rock. In case of an invasion, they can hide in them and the Turks will not see them. So here is the urban legend. So what happens in reality here is that the um, it is a kind of a volcanic type of rock, which is pretty much like a sponge, so it's super easy to work with it. And so that's one thing. It's easy to, for example, cut out in the living rock a full uh, house. And supposedly there's one more thing about it, kind of natural air conditioning, as in there's always roughly 15 degrees uh, in the and mind you this place already gets some proper sun and when it's summer it can get really hot and good old school winters that we used to have uh, several hundred years ago this place can get also minus 10 minus 15 so it's great for the summer and it's great um, for winter as well so people just started living in them um, out of uh, well comfort really and mind you, the Turkish invasions, that's the official legend, and maybe there's something about it in it. But reality, as usual, is much simpler. Now, how it works today? Actually, there are supposedly people still living in them, because they, you know, the, the basic idea still works. Um, but I imagine that it's a bit more modern that they show us here in this little uh, museum. But uh, obviously, we're not going to simply enter people's houses um, to check it out. But I guess today, even if they don't live in such places, they still use them uh, as, uh, I don't know, a, a little summer escape or simply as storage rooms. Now, I actually took it in as a museum, officially, that's what it is. But Vicky is smarter and she found out this place, seriously, is ready to go. So. If you feel like cooking, uh, you can pretty much start right now. Now, of course, this is not how the whole village looks like. What you actually get is one street, roughly three, four hundred meters long, with um, some old school stone houses hiding those rock cut um, apartments. And seriously, people lived there not a long time ago, as you can see. But um, some of them are in good condition, some of them are not. Uh, unfortunately, I imagine upkeep of such places is simply not cheap. So I guess they get help from uh, the Slovak government or the European Union and whatnot. But I also imagine this is pretty much a bottomless pit. And some still, some places, as you can see, still are waiting for proper renovation. But I was also told that in the future the idea is to actually turn some of them into touristic apartments. And to be honest, I think the idea is great. I would love to stay a night or two in such, um, let's call it, little Slovak Cappadocia. So I'm uh, wishing them all the best. And mind you, the locals are not waiting for things to fall from the sky. Let me show you one extra little place. One more very cute detail. There is a little cafeteria and the um, owner of the place told me that he actually lives in one such um, rock house, but everything that they gain uh, in uh, the cafeteria, it goes to the renovation of the places they left open for tourism. And mind you, what they sell is all craft and local. So if you ever come by, it's a good idea to leave them an extra euro or two. And when I say craft, there are plenty of options, but my favorite, there's local wine and local honey. And I think with all the flowers that you can see around, that's not a big surprise. But I have to complain about one thing. It is a cute place, but I would install round windows and doors and combine Cappadocia with Hobbiton. Anyway... 
let's continue. Let's leave the pretty Brhovce behind. Let's get deep into the forests of central Slovakia, into the curving roads leading us to my absolute personal favorite in the whole country. So in the next episode, expect plenty of O's and A's. But in the meantime, thank you very much for attention. And I will see you very, very soon.